All right, Dr. Roberto. Dr. You're going to show Roberto. us Usain Bolt and, um, and MJ. So I'm going to uh, present, I have two cases. Let's see if there is time for, for the second one. Two cases of a, a truly professional athletes that I had the opportunity to uh, take care of. And usually when you think about athletes' heart, many times you have to try and differentiate between the remodeling of an athlete heart or a patient with a hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. So let me briefly uh, review. This is a case of hypertrophic obstructive <laughs> cardiomyopathy. <laughs> and let me now review for you a case of an apical variant <laughs> of uh, apical cardiomyopathy. In, in, the, in the United States, you probably all know that- Was that a sigmoid septum or was that a true hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? <laughs> That's pre-resection. Pre, pre like, like so in Scottish the United stone. States, the most common cause of sudden death in a young competitive athlete is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In uh, Europe, it is a arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia and just one slide to tell you that long-term athletic training results in remodeling of all chambers of the heart, but what we always try to think about is an increase in end-diastolic dimension, an increase in wall thickness, an increase in LV mass. And of course, that is different according to what type of sport you do. So if you want to improve your, her uh, your health and remodel your heart, don't start with yachting or with curling, <laughs> because curling. that would be a bad idea. <laughs> but usually the sports in which you increase your dynamic and static exercise are the ones that uh, increase the remodeling, like cycling, canoeing, swimming, etc. So now let's go to our case. This is a true case of somebody that all of you would love to earn maybe one third of what this guy makes <laughs> in a yearly basis. So in the preseason, pre his physician heard an abnormal murmur. Everything we talked in this meeting about the stethoscopes and so on, just think about it, that you know, the, the main physician of this team is an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> so he heard <laughs> an abnormal murmur. So, <laughs> <laughs> the team manager did not know whether this, the team should re-sign his multi-million contract. So he came uh, to us. The good thing here is that you can order any test you want. There is no problem. They will pay for it. And you have to be very careful what you, what you, what you decide because there is a very big angry family looking at you. So this is his uh, parasternal long axis view. You can see the end diastolic dimension is 6.6. .6. His wall thickness is 1.2. His heart rate is relatively small, uh, low. It's 40 something, and he's in the office of somebody who will How probably tall decide. Was he? How tall? No, was he uh, he actually was a hockey player, a ice hockey player in Chicago. Okay. Okay. So uh, we did the apical views and the apical four and the apical, I mean, everything is looking good. We did some Doppler imaging and everything is great. So I'm starting to scratch my, I don't know what I'm going to do, but then we start imaging and we find this. Yeah. So this patient, of course, has a bicuspid valve. We talked about a couple of these in this meeting. We see that there is a very super eccentric jet, very difficult to measure things uh, as uh, we talked about uh, yesterday. So uh, we see this, then we do these types of measurements. You see that none of these measurements reach four. So what do we do now? Do we allow this, uh, we tell the team to sign this contract for many, many millions of dollars and let them go and hit himself in the ice, or what do we do next? Depend how good is he? <laughs> he is very good. <laughs> so, what do you, so what do you do next? You've got this guy here, he's, you've got his, his uh, 
livelihood in your hands. So you're going you're gonna to do any other kind of test on this guy? You want to know more anatomy? Anybody want to know more anatomy of his aorta? Act, what, what would you do? I think you want to know about the rest of his aorta. You want to know about the rest of his aorta? Yeah. I well, think so. this is, I mean, the rest, That's the rest of his aorta. That's the rest of his aorta. Right there. <laughs> the rest of it goes downhill. <laughs> it it, the, the it, it curves this way and comes down, <laughs> Pat. <laughs> All right, so you're telling us the rest of his aorta is probably okay. Yes. All right. So I, just to advance a little bit, we, yeah, yeah. we, everybody explained the guidelines of when we do something in aortic uh, regurgitation. The patient is definitely asymptomatic, and he doesn't have LV systolic dysfunction. His end-diastolic dimension is less than five, and there is no indication at this time to operate his uh, aortic sinuses, ascending aorta, everything is below 5.5. How much AI did he have? Yeah. Dr. How Roberto? Much, How much AI did you, well, did you tell him? I think it is uh, probably definitely between moderate to severe. How many did, did we go some some quantitation for him, uh, yeah, either a Doppler it? or CMR or something, or mostly for the? I mean, it is impressive, right? Did not uh, mean we we did a lot of this, and I yes. don't have it here. But That's fine. We didn't find anything. So it's moderate. It's, you're have, going to call it? Mo I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't no, no, call it moderate to severe. If moderate you want to, to call it severe, Pat, to severe, moderate to severe. Carla. My question is, what about his tissue Doppler and strain? Because we don't know if his LV is really that huge because he's an athlete, or whether or not it's because he's got significant aortic insufficiency. Okay, we. Uh, I don't have it here, but uh, I think his strain was around minus 19 or something like that. Okay. So just because we don't mean. We all don't know really what to do. There, there are guidelines that have to do with uh, athletes and, and uh, valvular heart disease. It seems that we have guidelines for everything now. But uh, moderate <laughs> valvular heart disease is compatible with participation in, more, in, more, in most sports, with the exception of those with high static and high dynamic components, which would which be is this person. Yeah. Athlete with severe valvular heart disease like this <coughs> athlete should be disqualified from competing in competitive sports. And following valve repair or replacement, athletes can return to sports, although they should have vo avoid high static and high dynamic sports. So he is continuing to play. And I just think, I mean, it's interesting just yeah. to see how we, how we deal with this. But it's interesting. I mean, these are obviously general statements, right? Right. Uh, regurgitant lesions, particularly AI, are very well tolerated. During sports, they're going to get more vasodilated, so necessarily the AI may not get worse. There's no you know, the ventricular enlargement is not that impressive. I mean, the question, if, they, if the aorta was on the bigger side, yes, I would be concerned about some, right. uh, some event during high-intensity sports. So I don't know. That, that would be my... Yes, he has an issue. That issue will, will need to be addressed at some point in time, take advantage of a few years of good athleticism, et cetera, and, um, and good income, and slow down afterwards. <laughs> Should he take antibiotics before he gets his teeth clean? <laughs> that's right. Maybe. Maybe. Indeed. So that, that's, that's So impressive. And then very briefly, a, a second a case. I uh, think you ought to get the orthopedic surgeon to to teach physical diagnosis, because <laughs> picking up an AI murmur, even a loud one it for an better. orthopod, is oh, pretty I, good. I also learned the, that the orthopedic surgeons are not only good at auscultation, but they're also good at EKG. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, a, this is also a very up-and-coming professional basketball player. He is, yes, very tall. And he's, yes, with a very extended family and <laughs> They, if you say no, he won't play, but you get killed. Okay, so, <laughs> so this is a, a, a 22-year-old athlete who plays professional basketball in the NBA. He was evaluated for a second opinion regarding his abnormal EKG. In the preseason, they figured out that he had abnormal EKG. The team physician does not allow him to continue training, and they want a second opinion. And is he, he's African-American? He's African-American. Okay. So you can see a very big uh, 
deep wave, T wave inversions on the precordial leads. I think uh, mm. Dr. Zogby presented a case with a similar EKG. Yes. So this is his uh, EKG. You see that he has a little bit, seems like increased wall thickness. He's not as dilated as the hockey player. These are his apical views. Uh, again, the rest of the apical views, his mitral inflow, his pulmonic vein flow, has a little bit of big reversal in the, yeah. with the atrial <coughs> contraction. Uh, this go. is again the tissue Doppler, normal, of course, S-wave. This lateral or septal, I can't tell, sorry. Septal. And how old is, of, how old is he? He's 22. 22. His echo, find, uh, his echo findings are, as you see here, his wall thickness was a little bit uh, larger than before. So I said, I saw that EKG and I immediately thought about this EKG. This is a football player from the University of Michigan. And uh, he had a I mean, similar EKG. I said, great, I know what to do. I'm gonna look so clever here. I, this, is my, this is the Michigan football player, not the basketball player. He's really a big guy, got really bad echo. 19 year, he has the same sort of very uh, abnormal EKG as I showed you. you we you give didn't... contrast and we make a diagnosis, of course, of an apical cardiomyopathy. So I said, great, I'm gonna give contrast to this guy. He has an apical cardiomyopathy. How come other people in other places? Because of course, these athletes go everywhere. If it's not that they come to the University of Chicago, they have gone to everywhere before. <laughs> so you, you never showed us CW uh, through here. You showed us PW, but you didn't yeah. show us CW. Yeah, I don't, I don't have it okay. here. So this is your athlete. This is the, this is, you see it's a little bit foreshortened, but I, it foreshortened? We, we looked at every view. He doesn't have an apical cardiomyopathy. Yeah. So the, when the patient then had an MRI, now I'm gonna just show you one view, because all the other views are just for the sake of time. Uh, he did, you can look at it. He had no delayed enhancement. And based on this MRI that I, I showed you before, this, uh, you know, I, when I put everything together, I thought this was a remodel heart and I think that he could continue to exercise, but he went to see a very famous physician that takes care of all of many of these athletes. <laughs> and on the basis of this MRI, the patient was diagnosed as having localized hokum. Localized, localized hokum. And was not allowed to play in the NBA. Metastatic hokum. Where, where's, where's the localization? Uh, I don't know what it was, but it seems that if you're a physician taking care of these athletes and you always say no, you always will be right because nobody will die on you. But uh, this is sort of what, what happened uh, here. Mm. So it's just interesting to show you that you can never be right. I want to take just 15 seconds. I, I showed this to Dr. Zogby in Arizona, but after this next couple of cases, I will be going back uh, to Chicago, <laughs> and I want to show you what I did to come here from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so my dogs will be waiting for me in, <laughs> in O'Hare. I offered the ride to Dr. Rigolin, but I want to leave you with this poem about Illinois. It's winter in Illinois and the gentle breeze blow, 70 miles an hour at 35 below. Oh, how I love Illinois when the snow's up your butt. You take a breath of winter air and your nose gets frozen shut. Yes, the weather here is wonderful, so I guess I'll hang around. I could never leave Illinois because I'm frozen to the ground. Thank you very much. Roberto, come join us. I think the, the last case, Roberto, that, that was fun. I mean, I still laugh at, at this point. The last case that you presented is very important for you guys. Athletes, they're heavily involved in sports, be it 
you know, runners or uh, heavyweight football lifters, players. football players, etc. Frequently, not infrequently, frequently will have very abnormal electrocardiograms. Especially Most African of them are bradycardic, bradycardi right? But they have STT wave changes, just like you've seen. And uh, I, I think I would be certainly very careful. So Roberto <laughs> Dick Darabo did an interesting study where he looked at the aortic size in professional basketball players who were very large, you can go ahead, I'm just, who were very large, who were very tall, and found that, that they did not have dramatically enlarged aortas. Has that been your experience? Yes, uh, we You know we, what I'm saying? So a guy six feet nine or seven feet has an aorta that might be four. That actually also tells you to the fact that, you know, when you write these chamber quantitations, there's always a big discussion on how you aorta. should index this, uh, right? Because right? like we index to body surface area, and you can be small and very obese, and you have a big. So that you know, if you do it according to height, maybe it would be different. But I mean, <coughs> uh, not that I see a lot of basketball players, believe me. But uh, just happened to stumble through a couple of these cases. Cool. Very but good. I mean, frequently and actually. To my knowledge, you know, athletes, quite a few athletes, stress echocardiography is, is part of their workup so that, you know, these individuals will be stressed just to make sure they don't have anything else that, uh, you know, in heavy, heavy exertion that they do. But that's part of it. Miguel, you have a question or? There has been a suggestion at times which could apply to that second case of yours if the person is willing to, to take a four month break from training. Yeah. Those EKGs revert to normal, and that could have saved his career, given what the other doc, famous doctor told him. So the, I wonder the, whether that came yeah, in that as is, a possible... That is, uh, I, I had actually a third case about that, but I, for time, I, I, detraining is what you say, yes. which is something in which you take a, a, this remodeling that occurs in a heart. If it's a patient that has, for example, an obstructive cardiomyopathy, if you stop exercising, the changes will not revert to normal. The EKG will continue, as Dr. Quinones says, remain abnormal. If it is somebody who's an athlete, these changes will go. And I have, usually what happens is that if you tell that to a professional athlete, they don't want to do they it. Don't, they don't. And they, they don't want to do anything. They don't want to do genetic testing. They don't want to do anything that could potentially jeopardize their career. I have a, somebody who was an athlete from Harvard, so he is probably not such a good athlete, yet very intelligent. <laughs> but uh, with, with in, in, in him, we, we did this like uh, deep training many, many times, and you can see exactly what Dr. Quinones is saying, that uh, this T wave changes revert to completely normal. He starts exercising, they become abnormal. I have it. We did it three times, which I think is a very <laughs> unique thing, just to make sure it was right. He's from Harvard. <laughs> so I need three times.